Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Will Fenton. I'm the Director of Scholarly Innovation at the Library Company of Philadelphia. For those of you who don't know the library company, we were founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1731 as a subscription library. We really created this sort of template for public libraries in early America. Uh, of course, in the 20th century, we really redefined ourselves as a research library where we support all sorts of tremendous researchers like one that you will hear from today. Our fireside chat series is a weekly webinar where we give our scholars, uh, typically our research fellows, an opportunity to talk about their tremendous research, whether it takes the form of a digital humanities project or an article or a book or a book to be. Um, and so I just really uh, relished the opportunity to hear about people that are actually being productive in this very strange, difficult time. Um, uh, as a uh, webinar, uh, you'll notice that this is a little different than a, a typical Zoom. You're not on camera. That is by design. We want you to feel relaxed. We want you to be able to put your feet up, have a glass of wine, and uh, enjoy yourself. At the same time, though, uh, there are a couple of ways that we can interact throughout this process. There's a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you sort of cursor down, you'll see a Q&A option. That is where I encourage you to log your questions as soon as you have them. Because if you're anything like me, if you don't write it, it's just going to pop out of your mind. Um, and then I will be using the chat function if I come up with anything clever in terms of a library company digital resource that I want to share or a book or article, I will send that out through the chat function. And don't worry about, you know, clicking all of that. We will compile all of that after the fact for you because we have your registration, your email, and we'll follow up within a week with a link to the durable version of this talk, a YouTube uh, video as well as any session notes that we have so that you could share this with any folks who couldn't join us at seven o'clock on a Thursday night. Um, so with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sally Haddon, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of History at Western Michigan University. Uh, Dr. Haddon writes about and researches law and history in early America. She is the author of Slave Patrols, Law and Violence in Virginia and the Carolinas, and the co-editor of three books. I'm just gonna, breeze to them very quickly. Signposts, New Directions in Southern Legal History, A Companion to American Legal History, and Traveling the Beaten Path, Charles Tate's Charges to Federal Grand Juries, 1822 to 1825. Dr. Haddon is currently working on a study of the earliest U.S. Supreme Court, uh, which is under contract, congratulations, with Cambridge University Press and a monograph on 18th century lawyers in colonial American cities, the subject of tonight's talk. She has notably been a research fellow at the library company, not one, not two, but three times, if I have that right. Uh, 2003, right. 2005, and 2016. It's a pleasure to welcome you this evening, Dr. Haddon. Thanks, Will. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming to this webinar. Uh, which looks at a portion of my soon-to-be-completed book on 18th century colonial lawyers. Uh, I want to thank Jim Green and Connie King and the other many wonderful, kind people at the library company like Will Fenton, uh, who have supported this research and my work in uh, various projects over the years. Their knowledge of the collections at the library company has made this project much richer and more interesting as a result. And so I'm going to switch over to sharing my screen at this point. So just a moment while I make that happen and hopefully all will go well. So there we are. Um, my book project focuses upon men working as lawyers in 18th century Boston, Philadelphia, and Charleston, and considers their lives from a number of different angles. I'm going to start with an overview of that project and then move in for a closer look at work that some of those lawyers performed in the post-revolutionary period on behalf of loyalist clients, uh, especially in the realm of debt collection. The book is tentatively entitled Cities of Lawyers, and it takes as its main focus attorneys who worked in urbanizing areas of early America. The study looks at all aspects of lawyerly life from family support and family formation, early training uh, with uh, lawyers who taught them to social groups they joined, their access to books, 
the creation of new legal materials, and even their political views. But the main focus is on how these men constitute another group of major players in the colonial urban scene. We've studied merchants, we've studied ministers, we've looked at sailors and spinsters and slaves, but we need a book devoted to another group, namely the lawyers of, of early America. They performed essential transfers of wealth, they offered various kinds of legal assistance in their communities, they amassed property in their own right, and eventually many of them came to join ministers as influencers of public opinion by the last quarter of the century. The first four book chapters adopt a life cycle approach to this um, particular group. Now we're used to seeing the life cycle approach uh, used in uh, thinking about women, for example, but I think it should also be applied to this particular occupational group. The few earlier studies that looked at colonial lawyers focused primarily upon their education in a sort of one-size-fits-all manner. Um, the, the assumptions made that after a young man was trained in the law, then that young man could practice and become every bit as successful as every other established lawyer. And the assumption was that once admitted to the bar, all lawyers did similar kinds of things, had the same kinds of practice, the same kinds of clients engaged in the same sorts of activities. And that's not really accurate. In chapter one, I look at barriers to education and the arrival of immigrant lawyers from overseas at the beginning of the century. The, the educational background that men needed prior to training, plus the personal qualities that people, like parents sometimes, thought that a successful lawyer should have. I contrast the kind of training that some young colonials received at the ends of court with the legal education they might receive if they trained in the colonies and offer up some ideas about how this began to set into place some differences that began to harden for men from Charleston who continued to train in London's ends of court until the 1770s and those from Boston and Philadelphia, some of whom trained in London from time to time, but more infrequently as the century went on. Chapter two looks at the experiences of new men entering legal practice for the first time, the actions they had to take to create a practice. So where men established their law offices, the physical location of those spaces relative to courthouses, as well as what objects they needed to have in those offices or when they went to court, all of the physical items uh, material culture from wigs to books to paper and supplies in order to be a practitioner. Chapter two also considers the creation of male sociability uh, as these young men moved into practice and began to travel on circuit together, as well as the solitude that many individuals had at this stage in their professional development. Um, until mid-century, solo practitioners were far more common than any kind of partnership arrangement that we're more familiar with today. Chapter three continues my exploration of how to establish a practice, building up a roster of clients, and it investigates the process of debt collection, the most common form of work for lawyers in the 18th century. It required detailed record keeping and a ton of correspondence. This chapter also looks at how newly minted lawyers um, began to turn to the practice of collating their own legal writings, possibly for publication, and the difficulties of publishing any legal works in the colonies. Chapter four moves these younger men out of that stage of establishing their practices and finding clients and considers what their professional lives were like in mid-career and beyond. This chapter dwells on the acquisition or loss of reputation, as well as piling up the accoutrements of wealth, uh, building houses, buying carriages, having portraits painted, and also purchasing slaves, all indicators of a lawyer's thriving practice, and the various social outlets that they had 
as they aged, um, the various leadership roles that might be available to them in churches or philanthropy groups, clubs, and also training younger men to become lawyers, uh, more established lawyers becoming lawyer teachers, uh, lawyer mentors to younger men. Lawyers in mid-career often began to specialize their work and some stopped traveling on circuit once they had enough clients close to home. For some men, leaving practice was also a stage in life as well. The decision to leave practice or reduce the number of one's clients and court appearances to a minimum for some became an option once they had acquired enough wealth or maybe made a fortunate marriage. And chapter four goes into the options that might be out there from posts in government to planting, uh, preaching, uh, I've even got one painter and full-blown retirement. The, the chapter concludes with eulogies and death plus the occasional scandals that cropped up that could obliterate some lawyers' reputations so thoroughly that they contemplated suicide. Chapter five shifts out of the life cycle approach and looks at the great disruptive experiences of the 1760s and the 1770s when the Stamp Act temporarily closed courts and forced lawyers to do without income for the better part of a year and got many of them to contemplate or begin contemplating what might happen if their political futures diverged from the British empires. Some of these men became pamphleteers and essayists, while others chose quasi-retirement. And once the war started in earnest, a number of lawyers chose to leave North America entirely. There was an out-migration of Tory lawyers headed to the Caribbean, to London, or to the maritime provinces of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick during the revolution. For younger men who wanted to get legal training while the war was ongoing, it became harder to lock down. Some young men had to delay uh, their legal studies for several years. And it became harder because established lawyers who might have trained them were themselves going into the army or going into full-time politics or diplomacy, or they left the country as Tories or they died due to events during the war. When armies occupied cities, some courts again closed and then reopened, and sometimes in the case of Philadelphia, closed and reopened multiple times. But legal process resumed sometimes without the more established and well-known lawyers uh, working. Well, the war provided an opportunity for men who were less well-established attorneys to seize those opportunities and build up practices in, in a new era. For all courts and lawyers as well, there were lost records, destroyed libraries, and massive dislocation uh, during the time of the revolution. Chapter six considers what happened to legal practice and lawyers in the world after the revolution. Some states totally rebuilt their legal structures. New jobs opened up um, as the, the size of the court system sometimes expanded within a state and it effectively doubled once there were federal courts that needed men to serve as judges and lawyers there. Lawyers um, in the 1780s and 1790s sometimes began to take partners as legal practice continued to expand geographically and move deeper into western regions of all three of the states uh, where Boston, Philadelphia, and Charleston are located. Legal publishing opened up other career opportunities as legal reporting of court activities uh, began capturing the words and decisions that American judges made in their various courts. And collective law libraries were built in Boston and Philadelphia offering men new ways to access legal texts without the direct expense of personally purchasing each legal volume themselves. They could and did join the social law library in Boston or what became the Jenkins Law Library in Philadelphia. And in several instances, loyalists who left the colonies attempted to regain their property confiscated during the revolution by using legal processes. And that leads us into the heart of tonight's presentation, 
uh, which is a portion of chapter six, about how loyalists use legal process to try to reverse the confiscations of the revolutionary period. They hired lawyers to do the work for them. Uh, I want to credit here Rebecca Brannon and Joseph Moore, who invited me to contribute a chapter to their book on loyalism that really got me started thinking about this particular aspect of my topic. It hadn't really been at the forefront of my mind, but their book, in case you don't know it, appeared in 2019 and is entitled The Consequences of Loyalism Essays in Honor of Robert M. Calhoun. And it was published by University of South Carolina Press, and the essay authors had the unusual opportunity after submitting uh, our essays of collaborating with a filmmaker to shoot brief videos about the research, which were later incorporated into a documentary for the Canadian Broadcasting Company entitled The Good Americans, and that was broadcast in, by the CBC also in 2019. Okay, so two key figures that I'm gonna be talking about from here on out in this presentation are Harrison Gray Otis, uh, scion of two uh, well-established Boston families at the time of the revolution, the Grays and the Otises, and Christopher Gore, by, uh, who, they, who came from more um, humble origins, a less affluent background, but who, uh, like uh, Otis, would rise to powerful heights by the time he left legal practice behind him. Both men did very well in the business of assisting loyalists in, in regaining their property, uh, but whether the Loyalists got their property back or not, though, these men got paid. Reclaiming lost Loyalist property through one means or another was familiar labor for lawyers working in this period, in the 1780s and 1790s. It represented only a slight modification of the routine toil most attorneys of the 18th century engaged in for they often spent more than half of their time collecting debts on behalf of clients, either in court or out of court, recovering lost debts, land, horses, ships, uh, even slaves, was such a part of everyday legal practice for 18th century lawyers that many of them kept stock letters and pre-printed documents on hand for just such purposes, ready for the moment when a client came calling. Loyalist clients, however, generally did not come calling at a, loyal, at a lawyer's door as others did, as other clients did. Quite a few uh, loyalists appear to have been known to their attorneys only via correspondence, a real bonus for historians because it allows us to rebuild uh, their activities and have a fairly, uh, a much more rich record, a more full record of their activities. Lawyers who didn't have the opportunity to meet with their clients face to face typically generated more correspondence because they had to request documents, they had to ask questions, they could propose legal strategies, and they could also explain court proceedings to people who remained distant from both um, their law offices and the local courthouse. That they did so, that they created these records, creates that treasure trove for historians to mine. The bundles of correspondence document how lawyers and loyalists worked together to reclaim property that the revolution had parted from its owners. Clients like these most often arrived uh, via letter through pre-revolutionary family connections or through pre-revolutionary business ties. But no matter how lawyer and client found each other, lawyers routinely had to counsel patients. Legal processes moved slowly. They still move slowly even now. I'm sure you'd probably agree. But in the 18th century, legal processes moved very slowly and sometimes hardly seemed to move at all. Harrison Gray Otis, working on behalf of one London-based client in the 1780s, reminded him how difficult a uh, collection of a debt was going to be due to both the appeals process for lawsuits as well as the lack of hard currency um, in early America. You know, he reminded his client, the loyalist Robert Hallowell, who was a mandamus counselor, we'll come back to them in a moment, but he reminded Hallowell that, quote, in our country, all collections are a very slow and gradual process, unquote. At the end of the revolution, 
Harrison Gray Otis was a young attorney, newly minted, recently entered into practice in Boston, where family ties began bringing him some work to do on behalf of absent relatives. Otis was educated at Harvard and a family friend, John Lowell, originally trained him. Lowell, a politically savvy guy, uh, trimmed his way through the 1770s by cultivating friendships on both sides, Tory and Patriot. Lowell ended up becoming the most popular criminal lawyer in the state during the 1770s, and he amassed a huge client roster during the Revolutionary War's early years. He was also, according to his biographer, Lowell was a favorite of many loyalists. Towards the end of the Revolutionary War, Lowell began to divest himself of his courtroom duties so he could spend more time on politics. He passed his clients on to the young men he had trained, like Harrison Gray Otis and also Christopher Gore. Getting clients in the immediate aftermath of the revolution was not easy. The financial climate was uncertain, and by 1786, when Otis was admitted to the Massachusetts bar, the state was politically unsettled due to Shea's rebellion. With his father a bankrupt and his mother's relatives fled to England as loyalists, Otis's family tree was more exalted than his purse. He was even compelled to take out a loan to purchase his own law books and open his first law office. So although Otis came from well-respected families, he began practicing with very little in the way of money. Making one's way as an untried attorney was hard work, and Otis was undoubtedly grateful for the clients his former teacher, Lowell, directed to him. Family ties brought Otis business as well. Uh, Otis's family tree was divided between patriot and loyalist. Otis's mother's family, his maternal grandfather, uh, in particular Harrison Gray, his namesake, fled Boston as part of the loyalist refugee movement eventually retiring to London with a number of Otis's other relatives on his mother's side. Uh, Harrison Gray could only wait and learn from afar what happened to his estate as the Patriots took charge. In May 1775, just after the war began, his estate was confiscated by the Massachusetts Patriot government and all personal belongings he left behind were taken for sale. Gray lost three houses in Boston and much, la much land scattered in a number of townships, which he hoped his grandson would be able to recover. Over the next 20 years, Gray maintained a correspondence with his lawyer grandson, Otis, who in the post-war years would build up a healthy practice attempting to retrieve the broken and scattered fortunes of dispersed loyalists like his grandfather. Meanwhile, on the other side of the family. Otis on his father's side was patriot to the core. Uh, his paternal grandfather uh, had even gone so far as to accept continental money at face value during the revolution, even while it was widely known to be depreciated and, and worth far, far less. It was in fact Otis's paternal grandfather accepting all this money at face value that contributed to the bankruptcy of Harrison Gray Otis's father. Uh, Harrison Gray Otis's aunt and uncle are better known to us. His uncle, James Otis Jr., was one of the stalwarts of the revolution. And indeed, uh, Harrison Gray Otis was supposed to go train to learn the law in James Otis Jr.'s law office. But the decline in his uncle's uh, mental faculties led to Harrison training with a family friend, John Lowell, who we saw earlier. Uh, meanwhile, his aunt, Mercy Otis Warren, pilloried Boston's British officials in plays and poems. So Harrison Gray Otis has this divided heritage. And it also explains how, in courtroom settings, Otis was able to play both sides of the fence. When he went into court, post-war Boston juries might understandably be reluctant 
to favor loyalist claims. But Otis could and did play the Patriot background card. Uh, in some cases, Otis had his loyalist clients assign debts to him personally, so he could recover the debts in his name without bringing the loyalists into court to make the claim on their behalf. So he, Harrison Gray Otis played both sides of the fence. Now the process of uh, attempting to recover and retrieve his grandfather's lost fortune, and I should note here, um, a portion of whatever he retrieved would come to Harrison Gray Otis through his mother. So obviously, if whatever he can retrieve for his grandfather, his mother might inherit a portion of. So Harrison Gray Otis has every incentive to work hard because he stands to inherit a portion of the money he's gonna recover. It took 20 years for this process to unfold and it yielded little in the way of positive results in court um, because his grandfather, Harrison Gray, had been banished by name. Uh, and here's the background on that. Harrison Gray had served as a mandamus counselor for the British after the revocation of the Massachusetts Charter in 1774. Now before May 1774, counselors who sat as the upper house of the colonial legislature in Massachusetts were nominated by the lower house and then confirmed by the governor. But once the charter was revoked, all counselors were chosen exclusively by the governor, General Thomas Gage, under the new coercive acts. This method of selection ensured two things. It ensured that the counselors were absolutely loyal to the crown, but it also likewise made those mandamus counselors immediately suspect in the eyes of patriots. Public pressure caused more than half of the mandamus counselors to resign, but those who held on to their appointments, like Harrison Gray, invariably fled when the war began or the British eventually evacuated from Boston. In April of 1779, of all the Massachusetts men named in the Massachusetts Act of Confiscation, Harrison Gray was listed fourth as a, quote, notorious conspirator, unquote, a signal distinction indicating that his stance on the revolution was particularly odious to the patriots. Although other confiscated property was returned to some loyalists, and we're actually gonna meet one of those later on, following the peace treaty that ended the revolution, the 29 men like Gray, who were named as notorious conspirators in the 1779 law, were deliberately exempted. Their property was not returned, a distinction suggestive of the level of hatred directed at them. This animus lasted into the courtroom as well, but Harrison Gray Otis also attempted to retrieve his grandfather's property through private persuasion also. For more than four years, Harrison Gray Otis attempted to collect nearly a thousand pounds that John Hancock owed Otis's grandfather without going to court, where he was certain he would lose against such an eminent man as Hancock. Now the debt was one justly owed. Before the war began, Otis's grandfather, Harrison Gray, was treasurer of Massachusetts Colony. And as treasurer, he had paid John Hancock an advance on his governor's salary at a time when the Massachusetts legislature had no money in its treasury, taxes at that point having gone unpaid for nearly two years at the time that Gray gave Hancock the salary out of his own pocket, expecting the legislature eventually to repay him. When Gray fled the colony at the war's outset, the debt remained unpaid. Otis wrote his grandfather about the legal strategy he intended to employ. Otis would present himself to Hancock as a relatively impoverished young man whose poor current fortunes were due to the fact that he didn't have the rich prospects in life he had once had when his family was wealthier. And Hancock could redress this fact. His grandfather vetoed 
this strategy. Playing on Hancock's sympathies in this fashion was a weapon that his grandfather would not permit. The grandfather wanted Otis to make the claim in his own name, in, in Harrison Gray's name. Hancock owed him, Gray, the money. And so no sort of woe is me approach by Harrison Gray Otis was acceptable to his grandfather. It was a debt of honor, a debt that honor required repaying. And Hancock would demonstrate whether he was honorable or not by what he did. Boxed in by his client, his grandfather's refusal to accept his advice, grandson Otis spent four years writing endless letters, sitting in Hancock's anteroom, setting up appointments that got delayed or canceled, and never had any satisfaction. In the end, Hancock successfully evaded Otis's pleas about repayment until his death in 1793. It was only after Hancock's death and the subsequent planned remarriage of his widow to a ship captain that Otis was able to recover part of the debt. Otis knew that going to law against the widow of a leading patriot like Hancock was also unlikely to win any Boston jury's sympathies. So Otis resorted to subterfuge. Otis discovered that widow Dorothy Hancock's intended second husband, a Captain Scott, planned to settle his new bride in England. Otis let a rumor circulate that he would prosecute the outstanding debt in England through English courts, where patriot sentiment could have no sway over a local jury. And indeed, quite the opposite effect was likely where you know, Otis might collect the, the debt in full plus interest. The newly married cop, uh, couple, the Scots, presented themselves to Otis in 1795 and repaid half of the money that was still owed. This final triumph of debt collection could not bring joy to Otis's grandfather, for he had died the previous year in 1794 one year after his adversary, Hancock. Otis reported the arrival of the funds paid in a letter to his father of the nearly thousand pounds originally owed by Hancock, now worth 1,200 pounds or more with interest. Otis recovered approximately 600 pounds in all. Working in or out of court, cajoling, threatening, and even circulating rumors were all part of a lawyer's work to reclaim lost loyalist property. Christopher Gore did the same, through his, though his work is less well documented in terms of letters to clients. Gore, however, left us a beautiful ledger book that indicates how much money he made from the loyalist law work that he undertook for um, loyalists as well as British clients living overseas. In 1785, Gore received in cash more than 2,500 British pounds sterling owed to his overseas clients. In 1786, the next year, the figure was closer to 4,500 pounds. This didn't represent a net profit to Gore, but rather it was cash flowing through his hands from debtors of clients he had from whom he collected after winning in court or finalizing a settlement. His percentage of those collected funds plus his fees was less, but still significant. In 1785, working on behalf of only two overseas clients, Gore earned more than 350 pounds. Bear in mind that this is roughly the time when four years of education at Harvard College would have been about 250 pounds. Gore's income was effectively a function of how well he could do on his client's behalf. He got paid if they lost, but if they won, he got even more money. And he charged them in, in the event for everything. He charged for horse hire, for certificates, for taking depositions, for payments to the sheriff to summon witnesses, for writing up deeds, for appearing in court. Any effort that he made was charged to his clients. Using the fees that he received, Gore uh, bought real estate and invested in land, both in Boston as well as around it. 
But Gore went beyond mere acquisition of property. In the mid 80s, meaning the 1780s, Christopher Gore bought Massachusetts government securities for, he paid $3,743 for securities, uh, state government securities with a face value of $25,000. And that also paid annual interest of close to $450. When the Massachusetts Assembly determined to pay its bondholders back at face value, not the depreciated value, during the contentious period leading up to Shea's rebellion, Gore realized a profit on, on those securities he had bought so cheaply of nearly 800% on his investment in state securities. He was encouraged to speculate further in government securities by his associate, Andrew Craigie, who profited handsomely in uh, national securities and national bonds, uh, as well as state bonds, drawing upon his insider knowledge via Alexander Hamilton, an associate of his. Hamilton uh, let Craigie know about the planned assumption of state debts and the likelihood that the national government would eventually repay uh, state debts in full also. In 1788, Gore and Craigie set a goal of capturing uh, $100,000 worth of continental bonds and certificates. Now that's 100,000 face value. Um, they were of course uh, circulating at a depreciated rate and Gore and Craigie managed to capture that 100,000 roughly thereabouts for uh, paying out only $20,000 of money in their hands. Now these were depreciated paper emissions that they were buying. Many of them warrants paid to continental soldiers and then sold off as uh, their circulating value depreciated. So Gore and Craigie scooped up as many of these as they could. For some of the purchases, Gore was paying only four and five shillings in the pound. So roughly a quarter to a fifth of uh, the face value and sometimes even less. Gore's financial juggling relied where he came up with the money, where he got the, the $20,000. Gore's financial juggling relied upon using the money he collected on behalf of his English and loyalist clients. While that money was still in his hands, he used it. That money gave him ready cash to purchase state and national government bonds when they reached their absolute bottom and before they were repaid at full value. This practice, very much like uh, you may remember reading a story about the article um, that Woody Holton wrote about Abigail Adams, bond trader. It's the same story. Um, Gore could repay his clients from the profits he made so long as he had a steady stream of revenue coming in. So this is a process. He's basically you know, taking money that's passing through his hands and he's using it to buy bonds and then using the revenues they generate, he's using that to pay his clients. And meanwhile, he's accumulating wealth. And Gore is not the only one who's doing this. He wasn't alone. There were a number of Boston attorneys who were working on behalf of loyalist clients. Aside from Gore and Otis, there were William Tudor, James Bowden, Perez Morton, Theodore Sedgwick. All of these guys had loyalists as clients. But John Quincy Adams, claimed that it was Gore and William Amory and William Wetmore who were the ones using loyalist debt money that they had collected and using that before they repaid their clients to finance their speculation in bonds. John Quincy Adams described what Gore and Amory and Wetmore were doing in a letter to his father written in 1790. Quote, these gentlemen I'm told have played at that hazardous game with monies deposited in their hands and have been enabled by the temporary possession of property belonging to foreigners to become masters of sums to an equal amount before they've been called upon for payment." Unquote. Gore, like Otis, was one of the attorneys who made a new kind of legal career from the wreckage left in the wake of the American Revolution. Gore also worked to provide advice on naturalizing new citizens, individuals who had arrived in America and who wished to remain permanently. 
Now, this was a new kind of legal work, unknown before the revolution, and it required understanding the processes and paperwork one had to file. At first, naturalization happened via a state act. Later, the process was taking an oath before a district level federal court. Now, this is work that Gore would have known from personal experience. During the revolution, his mother and sisters stayed in Boston like he did, but his father, John Gore, a carriage painter, turned loyalist and left for England. When the war was over, John Gore returned to Boston where he lived the rest of his days, and he, in 1787, filed a petition with the State Assembly asking for an act of naturalization to regularize his status. And the petition was in all likelihood drawn up by Gore because he, he filed many of these naturalization petitions. Um, and Gore was actually pardoned by the Massachusetts legislature and got some of his property back. He wasn't quite so notorious a loyalist as Harrison Gray was. Both of the men profiled here, Harrison Gray Otis and Christopher Gore, turned debt collection into fortunes that allowed them to exit practice and take up political careers after um, some years in practice. In little more than 10 years after entering private practice, Gore could afford to completely leave it behind and take up government work, which certainly meant taking a, a salary cut. He became a diplomat. Uh, he was one of the people who helped uh, negotiate Jay's treaty with England. Um, again, uh, accepting a post that would have pay little in salary and would probably have higher expenses. Like Gore, Otis also rose to positions of political responsibility. He was elected to Congress uh, as a Federalist in the late 1790s and thereafter appointed the United States District Attorney for Massachusetts in 1796. In Massachusetts, he served for many years in uh, the State House and State Senate but he eventually returned to Washington in 1817 as a U.S. Senator. In both cases, these many years of public service at the state and national level were heavily financed by the earlier work that men like Gore and Otis undertook, a portion of which uh, was wealth derived from having loyalist clients. Thank you for your attention. Turn off my screen share and hand it back to uh, Will. Oh, well, thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, I could tell you that uh, we have a quite a queue of questions for you. Okay. So people are very engaged. I want to just start with sort of a generalized question because of course we are the library company of Philadelphia. I feel like we've gotten a, a really good sense of uh, uh, law as it was practiced uh, in Boston. Do you have any sense of if these kinds of figures existed in Philadelphia or Charleston? Absolutely. Um, I have not been able to identify specific individuals who were doing this in Philadelphia yet, um, but I still have half a box of materials in which I might find those names, but I'm confident that there were men there doing the same kind of work. Uh, the, the ledgers are simply too full of loyalists uh, in lawsuits trying to uh, recover lost debts that there were lawyers representing them. So this was clearly a pattern of practice that you could see in all three cities. Um, in, in Charleston, uh, the Pinckneys were partly engaged in this kind of work, but there were also, again, some younger new men uh, who were doing this sort of work as well. And this is probably incentive for us to go out and pick up your book when it's available, right? Um, this is a plug, a shameless <laughs> finished. I'm, I'm trying to wrap up chapter six and get this to the publisher as soon as possible. So we'll see. Excellent. All right. So I'm going to work through these sequentially. So there is no favoring of questions here. They're all excellent. Uh, we have a question from uh, August Gus Widmeyer. I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. Please forgive me if I did. She asked, did the practice of reading law, that's in quotes, generally occur in your chapter one? Yes, absolutely. Um, I talk a lot about the kinds of things that they were reading and also uh, how those reading lists uh, varied a little bit as the century progressed. Uh, one of the biggest changes to the kind of law that's being read is the appearance at mid-century of Blackstone, which fundamentally alters how young men trained in the law. And so the, the guys who were before Blackstone have in some cases a much harder time uh, learning the, the technical law. And some of the men later on who had trained in the old way claim that the guys who trained after Blackstone appeared 
uh, may not have understood law as well as they did. Um, now that may have been bad nostalgia, but yes, that's in that's covered in chapter one. Thank you. Excellent. So we have a question from Jerry A. Uh, were communications between lawyers and loyalist clients mostly in writing because many of the loyalists were in exile or because their economic status was such that they felt it uh, beneath them to go see an agent? Well, partly it's their status. These are people who have property to leave. Um, you know, loyalists who um, were, were shoemakers and cobblers frequently didn't have huge piles of money, property, and, and debts to collect that men like Harrison Gray had. So yeah, it is partly status. But it's also true that because many of these folks are living abroad, coming to America represented a, a, a sunk cost, if you will, to trying to get that, that uh, debt reclaimed. And there's a long, steady uh, tradition of having agents uh, work for you uh, remotely um, having somebody who lives in another city uh, across the ocean or, or just down the coast on North America collect your debt for you. And business manuals laid out exactly what kinds of letters to write and what documents to include and how much of a commission you would be expected to pay. So this is actually, for men of business, this is actually work that they're, they're kind of used to working by correspondence with lawyers at a distance. So it's, not, it's, it's partly about status, but it's mostly about familiar practices. Hmm. So we have um, a, a comment and a question from Michelle Mormel, uh, who is a frequent guest and participant. We're grateful for her participation in these uh, fireside chats. She begins, Sally, your work is really inspiring. I would like to inquire about the suicides among lawyers. Obviously, there were multiple suicides that caught your eye in the archives. Were, were there more suicides among lawyers than among the general populace? Wow. Uh, I would have to defer on that question to people like Rick Bell, who have, uh, Richard Bell, who has written about uh, the topic of suicide um, and knows that subject more deeply than I do. My sense is that it's relatively rare. Um, the, the fellows who do it um, are immediately the subject of public speculation and a lot of, of correspondence going back and forth. Did you hear? Did you hear? Um, but the, the numbers are not that big. I was only able to identify three or maybe four to, that this applies to. And I would think actually that you're more likely to find uh, uh, suicides to be more common in other populations. So for example, I might think first generation African, African slaves might be, might tend to have a higher population, a higher, be a higher uh, demographic representative of suicides than than attorneys, but again, I, I don't know. I would say, ask Rick, Rick Bell would know. Uh, uh, University of Maryland. Yes, um, in fact, Rick Bell gave a tremendous talk about his latest book on the reverse Underground Railroad stolen. Uh, but the book right. that I think you're alluding to is We Shall Be No More. Um, and I dropped a link uh, to oh, Okay, there, there, are, there are a couple of people who've worked on this and I thought it was Rick who had, who had done that for uh, earlier work, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, mistaken. Rick, Rick's book is about suicide and self-government in the newly United States. Yeah, so I thought so. I think you're spot on. That's Harvard University Press. Definitely pick it up. He's an incredible scholar um, and, of course, a friend at a library company. Yeah. Uh, we also have a, um, uh, an anonymous question. You mentioned lawyer-client relations established through family connections and business ties. Is there any evidence of lawyers placing ads in newspapers for services, or was that action considered lowbrow or in some way unprofessional? Um, interesting question, and thank you for asking that anonymous attendee. Um, the, the reality is that it was considered somewhat unusual to uh, solicit for clients. And so actually one of the stories uh, in the book is about um, uh, somebody from the 1790s or early 1800s remembering who was the first lawyer to actually hang up a sign saying that he was actually looking for clients. Um, I have to admit that you really don't see anything like that uh, in the first half of the century, um, though it does become a little bit more common as the, the second half of the century rolls on. But it's not anything like uh, a Yellow Pages ad where there's an ad in every newspaper, uh, every issue, uh, looking for clients. Uh, have, you had a, have you had an accident at work or an accident with a car like you might see um, uh, nowadays? it was still considered something that uh, good lawyers did not have to do. Great. 
So we have a tremendous audience today. We have Jay Stiefel here who has asked a, uh, a trio of excellent questions. I'm gonna start with the first and then hopefully we can circle back and pick up number two and three. The okay. first one brings us back to Pennsylvania. What legal representation did pen proprietors receive in Pennsylvania in their pursuit of compensation for their unsold proprietary lands? Right. Um, you know, the answer to that is I know that they tried to pursue that through the court system, but it was uh, not successful. And I'm having a hard time remembering right off the top of my head who it was that they hired to um, to try to get something. I mean, but basically they, they had, it was largely unsuccessful as a, as a practice. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Okay. Well, uh, we have two more excellent questions from Jay, which okay. we can circle back to. Um, I would like to jump down to Tom McAndrew, who asked, who were the primary lawyers that the loyalists that had left the Philadelphia area employed to try to recover their lost possessions and debts? Okay, well, this is kind of, I think, actually takes us back to uh, Will's first question, which was, were there people like this in the cities of Philadelphia and Charleston as well? And the answer is yes. Um, have I been able to identify them specifically? No, because unfortunately I don't have the, I, I, like I said, I still have half a box to go through. Um, I may get an answer there, but right now I haven't been able to identify them as clearly and systematically as the guys from Boston. Um, I was really blessed to come up with Gore's uh, ledger and uh, the long string of correspondence that uh, Harrison Gray Otis had. But I know there were guys doing it because we can see loyalists, the, the lawsuits in the courtroom. But unfortunately, the names are not always attached to say who was actually representing them in court. And so without finding the correspondence to match, it doesn't work as well. And so I'm, I'm afraid I can't really answer your question. I'm sorry. Totally fair. Uh, so the mention of Gore does bring us back to Jay Stiefel's third question, which was, did the unscrupulous practice of Gore and other lawyers speculating with client monies lead to ethical reforms? It certainly led to a lot of people talking in the 1790s about the need to have a simpler language, that law needed to be simplified to the point that ordinary people could pursue it so that you didn't have to hire a lawyer. Lawyers were thought to be expensive. And certainly the fact that these guys are piling up money and then developing, uh, Harrison Gray Otis is one of the developers of Beacon Hill. Um, these guys are building massive, you know, very nicely designed, very well furnished homes. And so there was plenty of talk about trying to corral the legal profession. And this is part of where, um, part of the reason why in places like in New York and elsewhere, uh, you see a move towards the codification movement. The idea that like the French, if we could just codify law and what the penalties are for uh, breaking it, then people can read it themselves, they can know what the law says, they can uh, basically bring a lawsuit without necessarily any technical assistance. That movement doesn't get very far, um, but in part that may have led to greater self-policing. It may have also been the case that the opportunities for people to be as avaricious as openly avaricious as people like, like Gore and Amory and Wetmore were, uh, may have declined, that they may have kind of hit the jackpot uh, when there was that, that window of opportunity with state and national bonds that was less easily uh, grasped at, at later moments. Um, you know, I'd love to see somebody who was, um, you know, writing a book about lawyers uh, during one of the economic panics of the 19th century. We might have a, a comparison, possibility for comparison case there. Hmm. Um, I, I will note that Jay has uh, chimed in about the uh, representation of William Penn's descendants and he's okay. Benjamin Chu, who I should remember. Right. It's Ben, is it Ben Chu or is it Ben Chu Jr.? I think it, it now Ben Chu was one, uh, Ben Chu was followed in the footsteps of people like Lloyd, David Lloyd, who had been um, representatives, uh, legal, had been legal representation for the Penn family through many generations. But by the time we get to the 1780s, mm -hmm. I think Ben Chu Sr. was uh, fully retired from practice and was actually on the bench. So it might have been Ben Chu Jr., but I'd, I'd have to go, I'd have to go back and check notes on that. But that seems likely. Yeah, well, you are well outside of my wheelhouse, so I am not in a place to, uh, to weigh in there. We have a question from Linda Robertson uh, who asks, how did amounts reclaimed here 
compared to reparation awards by the king? Um, I, that is not a question I've, I've considered, Linda, but that's a good one. Um, one of the hardest parts to try to figure out is uh, to what degree we can compare um, things being paid off and then the, the transmission rates of, you know, when the money paid off in the colonies has to be converted into a bill of exchange and then it's paid back in London and what that looks like. The, um, but the honest truth is I, I haven't tried to figure out uh, what the value of the, the money was nor to compare it to um, the reparations. What I can tell you is that a number of the fellows who are loyalist lawyers uh, in chapter five of the book uh, did pursue um, uh, claims for uh, their losses and, and I've um, got some good juicy stories about, about some of those guys. So um, I, I hope that'll answer some of the question, but unfortunately not all when the book comes out. And um, I do see another question from Denise Boklin about the sort of Philadelphia aspect of the story. I think we can set that aside with the understanding that your book is going to very much address that. So we're, um, we're uh, going to, you know, sort of wait for coming attractions there, if that's okay. Thanks, Will. That's great. <laughs> and so we have um, uh, Jay's uh, second question and the third of his group, which was, right. were there any American lawyers in your period who had previously been admitted to the bar in Great Britain? How did their presence affect legal practice here? Were they paid any greater de uh, deference because of those qualifications? Um, yes. Uh, although the number that appear in the 1780s and 90s uh, coming from overseas is actually, I think, less than the number of uh, immigrant, what I call immigrant lawyers, who came from England in, say, the 1700s, 17 teens, and 1720s. There are a number of these guys who were trained in London, who emigrated permanently, uh, and who set up shop, and uh, some of them, some of them merited deference, and some of them expected it, even, even if they didn't merit it. So, for example, in Charleston, uh, Nicholas Trott is uh, one of the characters who had um, uh, trained in England and uh, came to Charleston uh, and set up shop as a lawyer and in quick succession is made uh, a judge of the Admiralty, uh, chief judge of common pleas. Uh, he ends up on the governor's council and uh, is taken to task rather firmly for being both a lawyer and a judge in more than one case. Uh, that was supposed to appear on his own docket, things that we think of as a little more than unethical. Um, so yeah, there were people who had, who had trained and uh, studied in London who emigrated and emigrated permanently. Uh, there are also some people who are kind of waved off and told don't bother. Uh, so for example, uh, there's one man who writes to his brother who's a merchant in Charleston and says, you know, I was thinking about taking my, the law degree I got in Scotland and moving to Charleston and setting up shop there. And his brother writes back and says, I don't think that's a very good idea. Um, I think you'll, you'll find if you investigate more closely that the law you've studied in Scotland will not apply um, the, 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 because Charleston followed a pure common law tradition, whereas in Scotland there's a mixed civil and common law uh, juristic uh, practice, uh, juridical practice there. And, and as far as I can tell, the brother never did emigrate. So um, yes, there were people who did. Uh, some of them expected to be treated like royalty and some of them didn't. Um, but yeah, there were, there were a number who did throughout the century. Well, I am so impressed with um, how you managed to answer that with um, uh, detail and nuance and at the same time to keep us to our time uh, because we managed to get through all of those questions uh, with such rapidity that I'm really grateful uh, to everybody who asked them and of course to you, Sally, for answering. Thank you. Thank you to all of the questioners. I appreciate the, the feedback and, and thoughtfulness uh, and also your attention. Uh, getting feedback on a project while it's uh, still in the incubation stage is, is always valuable. Absolutely. Um, so thank you again, Sally, for sharing this, um, this, this, this embryonic work with us. We cannot wait to be able to pick it up. Um, and um, certainly for those of you who have made a habit out of coming to our Fireside Chats next week, we'll be joined by another book author, Lucas, D uh, Lucas Dietrich, who will be talking about writing across the color line, U.S. print culture and the rise of ethnic literature, 1877 to 1920. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'll see you same time, same place next week.
Bye, guys.